Something exciting is happening in Guyana. They found oil, a whole bunch of it. Now typically when you find oil in the country, it either turns into a dreamland like Norway, or it turns into a Russia. And unfortunately, majority of the countries that find oil go down the path of Russia. Only a few countries have ever ended up rich and prosperous with a sudden increase in their oil production. In today's video, we break down what are some of the challenges that come with finding so much oil and what Guyana's future looks like while they deal with all these pitfalls and hurdles. So let's get started. In 2015, an oil exploration vessel named Lisa made a groundbreaking discovery. About 190 kilometers off the coast of Guyana, they found oil. Guyana, a humble country that had previously been trading its rice with its neighbor for oil, suddenly was sitting on top of the world's 17th largest proven oil reserves. The country's GDP per capita soared in the following years, painting a picture of prosperity and wealth. However, every coin has two sides, and Guyana's newfound affluence brought with it potential pitfalls. The oil curse and the Dutch disease, two pitfalls that it still has to deal with. The looming question is whether Guyana can successfully navigate both these challenges while positioning itself as one of the richest countries in the world and attracting foreign investment. Let me first explain what is resource curse or oil curse in case of Guyana. The oil curse is an economic phenomenon that tends to destroy countries where oil is found. Putin's authoritarian leadership that started the Ukraine war, Iran funding a bunch of proxy conflicts in the Middle East, or black snow in Nigeria. What do they all have in common? All of these countries are experiencing the resource curse. This so-called curse typically manifests in three different ways. The first being rise of authoritarian regimes. Now, to be clear, the discovery of oil reserves doesn't mean that a country like Norway or Canada with pre-established stable democracies would turn into an authoritarian regime. However, in monarchies or dictatorships, oil wealth definitely leads to power consolidation and nationalization of the resource, both of which give the supreme leader more money, and more money means even more power. For example, Saudi Arabia, which is a full monarchy with no publicly elected leaders in today's day and age, owes its existence to oil and the money that comes with it. The monarchy gets all its wealth from the oil production, and then a small portion of this money is used to finance welfare programs to keep any uprising in check. Second, oil discoveries lead to an increase in corruption. In many underdeveloped countries with weak government institutions, corruption has been noticed to increase due to oil. I mean, this story is as old as time itself. When the government makes a lot of money, some government employees will start to siphon as much of the money as they can, which further weakens the government's ability to provide essential services to its citizens, further making them poorer and the society more unequal. As the corruption goes up, the government officials and their friends and family make a lot of money. Meanwhile, the rest of the country gets little to no benefit. And if these citizens, who are clearly not benefiting from this oil wealth, start to protest or raise their concerns, the same oil wealth can be used by the same corrupt officials to repress them and silence them, hindering the democratic development. Third and final way in which the oil curse manifests itself is it can lead to an increase in civil wars. You see, when there is oil, there is money, and money gives you power. So there are a lot of warlords and people across the globe who are willing to wage a war to get that money and the power associated with it. Now, the likelihood of a civil war is further decided based on how much oil have you found. If there's a lot of oil, the government gets rich really quick before one can even mobilize a civil war. And they can then use the same wealth to fight off any future war attempts. Alternatively, if there is very little oil to be found, nobody really wants to wage a civil war as the profits won't just justify anything. The problem arises when you have a medium amount of oil as seen in the case of Nigeria, where after the discovery of oil in 1967, a civil war was sparked by two ethnic groups trying to compete for controlling the oil. Now that you better understand what the resource curse is, let's see how Guyana would fare against the curse. In order to understand how Guyana would deal with these potential pitfalls, we need to understand Guyana's history. Guyana is a former British colony and had an economy that relied on sugar plantations. These plantations were worked on by enslaved Africans and later by labor from India. Today, the population has about 40% people with Indian background and 30% with African descent. 
This gives the country a very unique and ethnically charged political system. After the independence from Britain in 1966, Guyana became dominated by an Afro-Guyanese leader by the name of Forbes Burnham. His rule was characterized by authoritarianism and one-party rule. Under his authority, the country saw a huge number of skilled labor and educated people leave for countries like the USA and Canada. And during his term, the economy further deteriorated as he had the bright idea of nationalizing all industries. By mid-1980s, the government directly controlled about four-fifths of the entire economy. However, in 1985, Guyana experienced a stroke of luck when Forbes Burnham suffered a heart attack. With his death, the country slowly started its journey towards democracy and economic reforms. Since 1990s, the country has made progress on the democratic front. If you compare Guyana to its neighbor Venezuela, which is currently affected by the oil curse, and Canada, a very stable democracy, it becomes very clear that Guyana has become more democratic over the years. While the oil curse is just making things worse for Venezuela, things seem to be getting better in Guyana. Given the history of the nation with Burnham's authoritarian regime, it seems unlikely that the people of Guyana would let another Burnham into power, at least for now. Let's look at the next one. After Burnham's death, Guyana's economy was opened for international trade. State-owned enterprises, which were practically all the businesses, were privatized. Government spending on transportation and education was increased to promote business. As a result of these reforms, you can see that between the year 2005 and 2014, the GDP per capita slowly starts to increase. And this is way before oil was ever discovered. And this itself is a very, very positive sign. However, corruption is something the country has suffered with over the years. If you compare Guyana to its neighbor Venezuela and Canada, it becomes clear that the corruption might be a thing that causes the most issues. The situation is better than back in Burnham's days, but far from perfect. As the economy grows and more of the oil money starts to pour in, corruption is very, very likely to go up. And as far as the third manifestation of oil curse, that is, a war is concerned, the threat is external rather than internal. Even though the country is very ethnically divided and has seen riots over the years, an internal civil war seems quite unlikely. Meanwhile, Venezuela, the neighbor that keeps coming up, has long claimed the Esquibo region, which constitutes about two-thirds of Guyana's territory. This, this territorial dispute dates back to the 19th century. Basically, the rest of the world believes Guyana looks the way it should. The Esquibo region should be part of Guyana. Apart from Venezuela, everyone agrees with it. So when the discovery of significant oil reserves happened in the year 2015, Venezuela all of a sudden had a refreshed interest in this region because it would give it even more oil as if it needs more oil. In the December of 2023, Venezuela held a referendum asking its people whether this region should become a state of Venezuela. Now, despite a very low number of people showing up for this referendum, the Venezuelan government declared that there was an overwhelming support for taking over this region forcefully. Given the fact that Venezuela is a dictatorship, it's hard to know which way this territorial war or claims might go. Now let's say when now let's say Guyana is somehow able to navigate both corruption and this threat from Venezuela, it still has to deal with another pitfall that comes with the oil. It's called the Dutch disease. Let me explain what the Dutch disease is through an analogy. Think of an athlete who receives a massive sponsorship deal. Suddenly this athlete has a lot of money and might just feel less motivated to train hard every day. After all, their financial needs are taken care of. This athlete might start spending a whole bunch of money on luxuries and enjoying a comfortable lifestyle at the expense of discipline and training. Similarly, with the Dutch disease, a country discovers a lucrative natural resource like oil, much like the sponsorship the athlete received. Now, as the nation sells this oil, the money flowing in starts to increase because everyone wants what they have, oil. However, this also makes the price of everything else produced in the country pricier, like manufactured goods or agricultural products. And as your export starts to get expensive on the global market, the global market will just move on to the next seller who sells the same product for cheaper, reducing the country's exports. Which means as the oil industry is producing all this wealth and is excelling, the rest of the industries within the economy start to lose. And this cycle leads the country to become overly reliant on this one single lucrative resource, much like the athlete became reliant on this sponsorship money. 
which means when a country finds a massive resource which starts to generate a whole bunch of wealth, it's very important for a country to really emphasize and work on improving the rest of the economy and diversifying. Because if things are left to their own means, the country will eventually just be reliant on one resource and very dependent on the fluctuation of, let's say, oil in this case. The prices may go up or down, or one day, the world might not need oil at all. What's the long-term plan? The government has set up a sound wealth fund, much like Norway. The idea is to save some of the money generated from oil for its future use and generations. At the same time, the government has been investing in building new infrastructure like a gas-fired power plant, which would make electricity cheaper for businesses within the country. Money is also being spent on better road connectivity and a deep water port is also being built. This should allow the businesses to move goods in and out, making the country better at business. While the oil boom has definitely increased the country's wealth and has propelled it towards a better future, it has also brought the pitfalls along with it of the oil curse or the Dutch disease. As Guyana navigates its way through these challenges, it remains to be seen how the country will utilize its newfound wealth for the benefit of its people. At the bottom of it all, a rising GDP per capita doesn't always depict the full picture. After all, what good is all the wealth if only the rich are getting richer? So yes, Guyana is on the path to become one of the richest countries in the world. Only time will tell who benefits from it. That's it for this video. I'll see you in two weeks time. Till then, peace. Bye.